Welcome to Candlewick Library. I'm Cheryl. Today is going to be the second part of the video that I put out last Tuesday. You're going to get the rest of the story about the Mormon handcart companies, especially the Willie and Martin companies. Now back to the Martin Company for a moment. They were in an even more severe situation. They hadn't suffered the loss of livestock that the Willie Party had, but they had more people. In October 4th, when they were at Scotts Bluff, they were about 100 miles behind the Willie Party. The Hodgetts Company, which had lagged behind since leaving Florence, caught up and camped with them near Scotts Bluff. John Bond remembered his shock at seeing the sunken eyes and emaciated forms of the handcart saints after their six weeks on the trail out of Florence. Bond noted that their shoes were worn out, their toes protruded, from the shoes and bleeding condition. In the same way, some were compelled to stay on the way and pull sand burns from their feet, shedding many tears. Bond was moved by the courage of th those traveling with infants. His manuscript was also censored and probably because he talked about condemning the handcart scheme itself. He said, whatever was on the agent's minds were in regard to the counsel to the saints, caused the trials and sufferings and heartburnings of an innocent and God-fearing saint. Following should have been more careful in giving them advice as those anxieties with self-confidence has rendered untold hardships, broken hearts, and so many deaths of love ones. The constant hunger felt by these Martin saints was comparable to that among the Willie party. As Jean-Jacques remembered in 1878, you feel as if you could almost eat a rusty nail or not a file. Josephine Hartley remembered a small deed from Martin. She said the captain was very kind to mother and gave her some of the flour sack to scrape off with a knife for what little flour was left along with the lint. And with this, she was able to make cakes and mush to help sustain life. Sarah Crossley, who was 12 years old at the time, watched her 19-year-old brother steadily weaken and succumb to the cold. His suffering was over one morning as we found him frozen in his bed. We were so numbed but with our suffering and the sight of death that I think we were almost glad he had gone. We felt that he had gone only a little ahead of us and that we soon would be with him. I did pray though that the commissioner of provisions would not know of it until I had received Joseph's portion of flour. I cannot tell you the pang that smote my heart as he counted out the spoons full and when he came to Joseph's he said, oh, Joseph died last night, didn't he? I had lost my brother's portion and it hurt me worse than it did to first look upon his still white face. People talk about that there are more men than women that died and that a chief reason for this was because they all were doing all this walking. They all were deprived of calories. But then when they would camp for the night, the men also had to do guard watch. And so they had a lot of extra work each night that others didn't have. They had to stand guard for six hours every other night. He has story after story here of different pioneers talking about their families and the things that they were going through during this part. And one of them that stood out to me was Margaret Clegg remembered the collapse of her father. He was too sick and he had to ride in one of the wagons that had provisions. One day he felt a little better and thought that he would try and walk, but he could not keep up as he had rheumatism so bad. He took hold of the rod at the end gate of the wagon to help him along. And when the teamsters saw him, he slashed his long whip around and struck father on the legs and he fell to the ground. He could not get up again. So because he's holding on to the wagon, he gets whipped so bad that he falls over. And he then crawled on his hands and knees all the way to camp. He was so badly frozen when he got there. They did all they could for him, but of course he died. There is another boy, Aaron Giles, that talks about being left behind. And he ended up being found later by soldiers and staying with them. On October 8th, the Martin Company reached Fort Laramie. Like the Willie Company before them, they found none of the promised provisions waiting for them. And they spent two days there trying to trade valuables for food. Several backouts elected to leave the company and winter there with the traders and soldiers, many of whom encouraged the saints to do so. But the vast majority of the company chose to push onward on October 10th. And it was during those days that the daily rations were successively reduced. On October 17th, the company reached Deer Creek. Even with reduced rations, Martin deemed that the hand carts were moving too slowly. Jean-Jacques said, owing to the growing weakness of immigrants and teams, the baggage, including bedding and cooking utensils, was reduced to 10 pounds per head. Children under eight years, five pounds. Good blankets and other bedding and clothing were burned as they could not be carried further, though needed more than ever for there were 400 miles of winter to go through. Bedding and clothes were burned to lighten their load to try to go faster. And then these people are going to be in freezing cold weather where they're going to need those things that they just burned. He says in here, why burn the baggage rather than cash it in case the Martin Saints changed their minds or perhaps had to return to Fort Laramie. And some believe from some of the accounts that it was so that they wouldn't have the temptation to return. Two days later on October 19th, the bedraggled Martin Company came to its last crossing of the Platte after which the Saints would cut the corner to the Sweetwater and try to follow it to South Pass. They have to keep going across this river. Five miles east of where the Saints waded into the water in the cold, a bridge 
was built by a French voyager and it spanned the river. As with all such bridges in the West, its owner charged a toll and they were simply too poor to afford it. Jean Jacques said in 1878, the river was wide, the current strong, the water exceedingly cold and up to the wagon beds in the deepest parts. Some of the men carried some of the women over on their backs or in their arms, but others of the women tied up their skirts and waded through like heroines as they were. And as they had done through many other rivers and creeks, the company was barely over when snow, hail, and sleet began to fall. Thomas Durham wrote, we had a very heavy hailstorm that day and the river was very high and the water very cold. In this crisis, heroes emerged. 12-year-old John Bond traveling in the Hodgetts Wagon Company, they made the fort at the same time and he remembered, the captain repeated, have faith in God and you will not take cold while he sat on his mule and saw those innocent ones who had pleaded so fall in the river as the current was carrying the weak ones off their feet. But with the stronger and manly aid and courage of John Lady, T.J. Franklin, John Toon, Geo Haynes, Geo Dove Sr. and others, the helpless and weakened ones were taken to the opposite bank of the river and were given all the care they could when brought from the icy cold water. Those noble heroes went backward and forward several times carrying them on their backs. The Martin Company staggered on a single mile and camped near midnight. On October 20th, it snowed continuously. The Saints covered only five miles before camping again. By sunset, 12 inches of snow lay on the ground. Inevitably, death now started to take a grim toll among the underfed, ill-clothed, and exhausted immigrants. And of course, then there are more and more and more stories of the people dying. A lot of these accounts talk about 13 people that had died that night. The first team to move out of Salt Lake on the rescue mission was on October 7th, and it was in the, under the command of George Grant, and he had 27 men and 16 wagons. Among those were missionaries who had just got there and were willing to turn around and go back. One of these included Chauncey Webb, the master handcart craftsman. After joining the Martin Company, with whom he traveled from Iowa City to Florence, if you remember, he was the one voice in that group that had talked about not going Going forth yet. And then he had been able to travel in Franklin Richards' faster wagon. So he decided to go back with the rescuers. Richards himself declined going. Even in Salt Lake, he was consistently underestimating the seriousness of what was happening in this crisis. He advised Grant that his advanced team of rescuers ought to run into the Willie Company somewhere near the Green River crossing well to the southwest of South Pass. Grant's entourage was traveling really fast. They reached Fort Bridger on October 12th, but there they heard no news of the handcart companies, not even a rumor. He immediately dispatched four men to speed ahead with fast horses and a single light wagon laden with minimal cargo of flour as a scouting party. On October 15th, the team reached the Green River, yet still no sign of either of the handcart companies. There was no way for them to know, but as this express team of four, Joseph Young, the prophet's oldest son, Cyrus Wheelock, Stephen Taylor, and Abel Gar moved out ahead of Grant's rescue team, the Willie Company was still 160 miles to their east in the vicinity of Independence Rock. Grant had a weird strategy here. He dropped off splinter groups along the way to set up stations along the trail instead of taking them all with him at once. If they had known the actual condition of these pioneers, then they would have wanted all of their supplies together. The conditions of the Willie Company had begun to slide from desperate to hopeless. Deaths occurred daily. The details of many of them have escaped historical record, but every once in a while you get a picture of it. Sarah James, who was 18 at the time, recorded October 18th as the company broke camp. As usual, there were dead to be buried before we could go on. Her father and her 14-year-old brother Reuben lingered to help with that detail. And by that evening, there was still no sign of them. She said, when we stopped for the night, we made inquiries about our people, but nothing had been heard of them. Since there were some who had been a few hours behind us, we felt that they would come with the next group. All night we waited for word. Toward morning, some of the captains who had gone out to gather up the stragglers came into camp bearing the dead body of my father and the badly frozen body of my brother Reuben. His injuries were so so bad he would suffer from them for the rest of his life. On October 19th, as the Willie Company forced its passage across 16 miles between the 5th and 6th crossings of the Sweetwater, the violent snowstorm struck almost without warning. The party had reached a marshy lowland known as the Ice Slough or Ice Spring. So the advance parties finally met up with the Willie Company. In the official journal, William Woodward reported the company rolled on again and we were soon met by Cyrus H. Willock and Joseph A. Young and two other brethren from the valley, bringing us the information that supplies were near at hand. The camp halted, a meeting was called Brother Wheelock informed us of the liberality of the saints in the valley, of Brother Brigham Young's kind-heartedness in speaking on our behalf, and that they would be getting supplies soon. For all the joy that this brought, it didn't really help them because they didn't have any supplies yet. So within hours, the express train moved on looking for Martin's company. No diaries or journals record receiving any kind of food from this first advance party. That day and night and following morning, five more pioneers died. On October 20th, for the first time during the whole journey, the Willie Company found itself unable to move forward. George Grant 
France rescue team also was stalled in the same storm. On October 19th, the remaining men and wagons had turned into a brushy stand and set up their own camp on Willow Creek, 25 miles west of the Sixth Crossing, where the Willie Company was marooned. In their camp at Sixth Crossing, instead of waiting two hours or even a day or two for the blessed rescue, the Willie Company spent three days without relief. Anne Rowley, the widowed matriarch, swore that for 48 hours straight during those three days, they ate nothing. 12-year-old John Oborn later remembered it as most terrible experience of my life. Captain Willie and Joseph Elder decided to get on horseback and go to try to intercept the flower-laden wagons, the wagons that would have the food, and they expected to find them within hours and a few miles, but after several miles, they couldn't find them. Ahead of them loomed Rocky Ridge, a barren five-mile-long series of hills that rises more than 600 feet to an altitude of 7,300 feet. The scouts felt they had no choice but to tackle this obstacle. On October 19th, Grant's party had veered off the trail and was camping where nobody could see them. Thankfully, one of them had put up a sign in case the other people came back, and so they were able to see that sign, and it directed them, and they were able to find them. So when they return, they have this wagon with them. Chislett recorded the momentous return of Willie and Elder with Grant's rescue train. On the evening of the third day after Captain Willie's departure, just as the sun was sinking beautifully behind the distant hills, on an eminence immediately west of our camp, several covered wagons, each drawn by four horses, were seen coming toward us. The news ran through the camp like wildfire, and all who were able to leave their beds turned out to see them. Shouts of joy rent the air. The myth that has come down to present-day Mormons is that this rescue party saved the companies. Everybody died before this. Like, that is what I was taught. I don't know if they're still doing that now, but definitely when I was growing up, once the rescue party got there, they were saved. But that's not true. They definitely made a huge difference. We don't have any idea what would have happened if they hadn't met up with them at this moment. And without their help, it's possible that everybody would have died. But for many of them, it came too late. In both the Martin and the Willie Company, more saints died after the rescuers reached them than during all of the previous weeks. Because at this point, they were already starving and then the winter hit. If we want to say it's just the storm, that's not taking into account how weak these people were already when the storm got to them. Only now did Grant's rescue team learn that Martin's company, larger in numbers, was no doubt in more desperate situation behind them. So he performed a kind of triage. He left six wagons for the Willie Company, whom he put under the charge of William Kimball to try to rally the ill and exhausted and carry them forward to Zion. And then with the bulk of his team, he forged on to try to find the Martin Company. Kimball, the man that was put in charge of them, was the one that had talked about that only enough snow would fall that they could be able to put it in their mouth. And so they called him the snow prophet. The first few days of that march, it was like a forced march under Kimball's leadership, and they had to go 10 miles, camped at the foot of what is now called Rocky Ridge. So they're right there at Rocky Ridge now. There were a large number of sick and children in the wagons, and now they had to go up the ascent. Levi Savage wrote, this was a severe day. The wind blew awful hard and cold. The ascent was some five miles long, and some places steep and covered with deep snow. So they had to go up this hill, and then he said he passed several on the road, arrived in camp about four miles travel, but few tents were pitched. Men, women, and children sat shivering with cold around their small fires. Some time elapsed when two teams started to bring up the rear. Just before daylight, they returned, some badly frozen, some dying, some dead. It was certainly heartrending to hear children crying for mothers and mothers crying for children. By the time I got them, as comfortably situated as circumstances could admit, which was not very comfortable, day was dawning. I had not shut my eyes for sleep nor lain down. I was nearly exhausted with fatigue and want of rest. Two days later, Levi Savage would find himself too tired to even write in his journal anymore. But other saints remembered the Rocky Ridge for the rest of their lives. Michael Jensen, who was only 11 at the time, said, my father was very weak from lack of food and so the men in charge of the wagons fastened our handcart to one of the wagons and told my father to hang on to it. He was walking between our handcart and the wagon when he slipped and fell and before anyone could reach him, the handcart had passed over him as he lay on the ground. They picked him up and put him into the wagon and went on till dark, camped for the night. Sometime during that night, my father died. John Chislett wrote a lot and he said, the day we crossed Rocky Ridge, it was snowing a little, the wind hard from the Northwest. The ascent of the ridge commenced soon after leaving camp. I'd not gone far up before I overtook a cart that the folks could not pull through the snow, here about knee deep. I helped them along and we soon overtook another. By all hands, getting to one cart we could travel, so we moved one of the carts a few rods and then went back and brought up the other. He rallied perhaps a dozen people who would have otherwise given up and died, helping to pull their carts to the summit. On the far side of Rocky Ridge, the immigrants ran into a stream that was nearly frozen over. The oxen could not be forced to cross it. It was 5 a.m., he remembered, before the last team reached the camp. Frell historians argue to this day about the location of this camp. Most place it on Rock Creek, but others believe the company reached Willow Creek. William Woodward, in the official journal entry of October 24th, wrote, it was concluded to stay in camp and bury the dead as there were 13 persons to inter. In addition to the 15 dead, according to 11-year-old Medi Mortensen, a big, strong-looking Swedish woman who was in our tent lost her mind. Despite Grant's rescue team, with its 
supply of provisions, and despite the arrival on October 24th of a second rescue team, six wagons under the command of Reddick Allred, 15 men, women, and children died in a single night and day. It is a powerful testimony to how memory reshapes events that several of the Willie Saints later wrote about the crossing of Rocky Ridge and the mass internment in camp the next day, as if both had happened before the rescue. On October 25th, the company started in motion again, and for the first time in weeks, they had a ration of a full pound of flour per adult. Yet from that day on, according to Chislett, two or three died every day. On the 25th, he recorded the death of four more men, ranging in age from 22 to 65. Two days after that, many persons were sick, and it was late before we were in camp. On November 2nd, he observed that the captain himself had become crippled. The Willie Company then becomes infested with lice. Despite the aid of increasing numbers of wagons sent out from Salt Lake, most of the saints still were pushing and pulling their hand carts. When you're reading this, you'll still, you'll just get story after story after story here of this hardship of pushing it during this time. John Amundsen, the Danish sub-captain who would later leave the church, he came to hate the hand carts, which he later referred to as two-wheeled man tormentors and two-wheeled infernal machines invented by Brigham Young. On November 2nd, the party reached Fort Bridger, and at last, there were enough rescue wagons that all the saints could ride. There's a myth or a story that a woman talked about how she hated the hand cart so much that she pushed it off the edge of a cliff and watched it crash to the ground. Nobody is sure if that really happened or not. Despite finally having enough food to eat and the luxury of riding in the wagons, people continued to die. The last of those deaths occurred on November 9th, the very day the saints finally reached Zion. The main greeting party was made up of Mormon bishops who had been assigned the task of finding families to take in these saints as they arrived. Along with the joy of seeing them when they finally arrived, they were shocked to see the actual condition of these people. No definite count of the Willie Company will ever be reckoned. The official church source says 67 dead, which would be 13.4%. However, Robert Reeder, who was 19 during the journey, he believed that 100 had died. Since the church sources and Leroy and Anne Hafen are inclined to underestimating things. It's probably much larger than the 67 that the church source says. B.H. Roberts, who was also a historian for the LDS church, he felt like the number was closer to 77. John Amundsen resolved to file a former complaint against the snow prophet William Kimball with Brigham Young himself. He apparently did so, for in his secret history, Amundsen writes ruefully, Oh, you trusting simpleton, the prophet laughed right in my face. In the immediate aftermath of the Willys Company's arrival, church authorities went out of their way to minimize this tragedy. Millen Atwood, Willie's fanatical second in command, rose in the tabernacle a week after the party came in and told a large congregation, we did not suffer much. We had a little bit of snow, but that was nothing, and we had enough to eat as long as it lasted. And when that was gone, you furnished us more. We fared first rate. And on November 12th, just three days after the frostbitten and emaciated saints entered the Salt Lake Valley, the Deseret News which is still the church-owned newspaper here, published this. After all the hardships of the journey, mainly consequent upon so late a start, the mortality has been far less in Brother Willie's company than in many wagon companies that have started seasonably and with the usual conveniences for the trip. The eminent feasibility of the handcart movement has been previously demonstrated. Its helpfulness is now proven by the experience of this company. So right afterward, the Deseret News is putting out to the people, they did have some hardships because they left too late, but no more than other wagon trains. This, this company proves that this can be done and that this is a good idea. That blows my mind. It actually made me angry when I first read that because I just couldn't believe that they would minimize what these people went through to this extent publicly like that. I mean, I can believe it because they still do this kind of stuff, but it's still just so ridiculous that it's almost unbelievable. Even with the 67 deaths, even if that was the correct number, that's still thir over 13% dead. An average non-Mormon wagon company had a 2% death rate, and yet they're comparing the two. It isn't just lying, it's dishonoring what the people went through, and it is dishonoring the dead. There is a story in here of how Brigham Young, six days later, decided to set out on the trail, hoping to reach Fort Bridger and greet the handcarts as they came in, but they thought of it as like a picnic. They brought along their favorite wives, but they got no further than East Canyon Creek, just a few miles outside of Salt Lake when Young became violently ill and they had to come back. So what about the Martin Company that is still out there? After making initial contact with the Willie Company during the October 19th snowstorm, the express rescue train Young, Wheelock, Taylor, and Gar hurried on to search for the Martin Company and the Hodgett and Hunt wagons. During those three days of constant storm, they were pushing through deepening snow and they covered 45 miles reaching Devil's Gate. So now these wagons are right here at Devil's Gate. That is where the name of the book comes from. Franklin Richards had assured Grant that he would meet the Martin Company at Devil's Gate or farther west. So when they reached the gate and found no sign of the company yet, 
they were very alarmed and they stopped and they obeyed orders and waited there for four days. So they started to wonder, did this company stop at Fort Laramie? Did they stop somewhere to winter over? Are they still coming? And they came really close to calling off the mission at this point. But as of October 26, the Martin Company had been stalled for six days in their Camp Beneath Red Buttes, a full 65 miles east of Devil's Gate. With them was the Hodgetts Wagon Company, also unable to move. Even farther east lingered the Hunt Wagon Company. At last, on October 27th, Grant decided to send ahead yet another express scouting team with fast horses. The three-man mission was made up of Joseph Young, Abel Gar, and Daniel Jones. According to Jones' account, they ran at full gallop, but lost half a day when their horses strayed off to follow a herd of buffalo. The Martin Company and Hodgetts Wagon Party had not moved for seven days. Their rations had recently been reduced to four ounces, so just a little bit more than this three-ounce bag. That's for adults, and then two ounces for children. Many of these pioneers in this group had just reconciled themselves to death. They were just expecting it. Death had become so familiar that it had lost its influence on them. And both Patience Loader and Jane Griffiths later remembered that at Red Buttes, 19 members of the company died in a single night. Josiah Rogerson went even further, insisting many years later that after October 23rd in the Red Buttes camp, there were six to eight more deaths in the next 24 hours. By now, Virtually no one in this group was keeping a, a diary. But 12-year-old John Bond that was in the wagon company, he said that he saw the saints wringing their hands and stamping their feet, they were so cold. And he described a mass burial as hymns were sung and prayers spoken, as wolves howled in the distance. This rescue wagon is coming for them. They don't know it. They don't know where they are. And the best account of the Martin Company's deliverance on October 28th appears in the memoir of John Bond, the 12-year-old. He said, in the after part of the day, I was playing in front of Sister Scott's wagon with her son Joseph, then seven years old, and his mother was looking to the westward. All at once, Sister Scott sprang to her feet in the wagon and screamed out at the top of her voice, I see them coming, I see them coming. Martin reported that 56 members of the company had perished since they had left Florence. Young then ordered the immediate disbursement of a pound of flour per adult from what must have been the last remnants of the company's supply. He told the people to gather up and move on at once, as the only salvation was to travel a little every day. From Martin, Young learned that the Hunt Wagon Company was marooned a good 15 miles farther east somewhere near the banks of the Platte. So after tending to the Martin and Hodgett companies, the three express scouts rode on once more at a full gallop to locate the last of all the immigrant caravans. So as they are all arriving at Devil's Gate, Grant at once realized the impossibility of solving this crisis. Several of the people were nearly starving, and he knew that his 10 wagon loads of flour could make only a tiny and temporary improvement in their ordeal. For several days, he boosted the daily ration to a pound of flour per adult. Even so, a few saints died between Greasewood Creek and Devil's Gate, including six-year-old Herbert. Robert Griffiths, whose 12-year-old brother John had died at Red Buttes. The Martin Company reached Devil's Gate on November 2nd. Captain Grant called a council meeting. Among the options he considered was having a whole 900-person throng at stay at Devil's Gate and try to winter over, but common sense prevailed because they would have just kept dying. He did send Joseph Young and Abel Gar back to Salt Lake City, riding as fast as they could, carrying a letter to Brigham Young. Although Grant's letter to the Prophet reported the desperate plight of the last three companies, and even though that letter was published in the Deseret News on November 19th, in the same issue, the official newspaper published a short report that defies credibility. Elder Joseph A. Young and Brother Abel Gar arrived from the three immigrating companies yet due at 4 a.m. on the morning of the 13th. Elder Young reported the condition of the immigration to be very favorable, considering the lateness of the season, and that abundant relief would reach them soon after he left Fort Bridger. Along with the flour, the relief wagon carried some 500 articles of clothing. Robert Burton's list of these items include 157 pairs of socks and stockings, 102 pairs of boots and shoes, 100 coats and jackets, and even bizarrely 27 handkerchiefs and 14 neckties. The handcarts had to be abandoned, but there was not nearly enough room in the wagons to carry all of the ill and the lame people. And they needed to leave stuff behind. And so they came up with this idea to leave all the stuff at Devil's Gate and that there were some men that had to stay behind and guard the stuff. Daniel Jones realized he had volunteered to winter over at Devil's Gate and guard the goods. So it was obvious to Grant that in this weather that they could not move on, but they had to. So about two and a half miles to the west of the fort, the low granite ridge bordering the valley on the north bent like a horseshoe, forming a semicircular cove. That cove offered the best shelter anywhere nearby with the added advantage that the slopes of the ridge grew thick with pines and junipers, potential firewood. To get the company to what has become known as Martin's Cove, it required the crossing of the Sweetwater River. It ran two to three feet deep at Devil's Gate, but 30 to 40 yards wide, and now it was flowing with thick cakes of ice. This seemed like more than they could bear. 
The crossing took the better part of the day on November 4th. John Jacks later said, in the rear part of the company, two men were pulling one of the hand carts, assisted by two or three women, for the women pulled as well as the men all the way, so long as the hand carts lasted. When the cart arrived at the bank of the river, one of these men, who was much worn down, asked, have we got to go across there? On being answered yes, he was so much affected he was completely overcome. That was the last straw. His fortitude and manhood gave away. Oh dear, I can't go through that, he exclaimed and burst into tears. In the end, one of the boys from the valley among the rescuers carried the women across the Sweetwater on his back. He tried to carry Jimmy too, but slipped and fell, dunking both men in the icy current. Meanwhile, the stronger man was left to try to pull the cart across the stream. Several boys from the valley, that's it's in quotations, helped Patience and her sisters trundle their cart across the Sweetwater as well. Out of the undoubted courage of the boys from the valley during the crossing of the Sweetwater grew one of the biggest myths in LDS history and it was crystallized by Solomon Kimball in 1914 in a church publication called The Improvement Era. He said, after the company had given up despair, after all hopes had vanished, after every apparent avenue of escape seemed closed, three 18-year-old boys belonging to the relief party came to the rescue and to the astonishment of all who saw, carried nearly every member of the ill-fated handcart company across the snowbound stream. The strain was so terrible and the exposure so great that in later years all the boys died from the effects of it. When President Brigham Young heard of this heroic act, he wept like a child and later declared publicly, that act alone will ensure C. Allen Huntington, George W. Grant, the captain's son, and David P. Kimball, an everlasting salvation in the celestial kingdom of God. This story was passed down and passed down and passed down, and it's quoted as truth in the Hafen's handcarts design, and it has been spoken of by other prophets since then, and people are always saying those boys are going to celestial kingdom immediately. Their salvation is, in, is intact for what they did here. But it was not until 2006, LDS historian Chad M. Orton demonstrated that none of these boys in the rescue mission was 18 years old, that a number of men, not just these three, helped the hand carts across the ford, and that many of the people came across unassisted. Most importantly, he found the true death dates of Grant, Kimball, and Huntington to be 1872, 1883, and 1896, respectively, 16, 27, and 40 years after this happened. Kimball and Huntington, in fact, outlived Brigham Young. While there were heroes here and people helped each other, they have minimized the real heroes by making a fake story to, I don't know, build faith, I guess, or to, to use as one of those stories that they tell over and over again. The Martin, Hodgetts, and Hunt Company spent five days in Martin's Cove. The cold was beyond brutal. November 6, the thermometer plunged to a new low of minus 11 degrees. Widespread frostbite became inevitable. Several days were windy, and on the worst days, the gusts blew down every single tent. The vigil in Martin's Cove was so grim that some of the saints later remembered it as lasting much longer. Patience Loader thought that she and her family had spent nine days in the cove. The hundreds of saints marooned in Martin's Cove quickly devoured the bulk of the relief party's flour. On November 5th, the daily ration, which had been boosted to a pound a day per a for about a week was reduced once more to four ounces. Two of these per adult and one of these for children. Peter McBride recalled, we had nothing to eat but some bark from the trees. His 13-year-old brother Heber said, nearly all the children would cry themselves to sleep every night. My two little brothers would get the sack that had flour in it, turn it inside out, and suck and lick the flour dust. He tells the story of one woman who had a six-year-old son named Robert who had severely frostbitten feet, and so every night she would take a portion of his feet off with scissors, but every day more decayed until his feet were gone. In the Hunt Wagon Company, the family of William and Mary Goble suffered excruciating losses. Their daughter, only two years old, had died in Iowa City. As another daughter, 13-year-old Mary, would remember later, my brother James ate a hearty supper and was as well as he had ever was when he went to bed, but in the morning he was dead. My feet were frozen, and also my brother Edwin and my sister Caroline had their feet frozen. It was nothing but snow. Caroline would die before the party reached South Pass. Mother Mary, 43 years old, would persevere until the day the company finally reached Zion, only to die just a few miles short of Salt Lake City. Captain George Grant still expected some more relief wagons to show up, and when they didn't, he began to recognize the only chance of survival for the three companies would be to rouse them to move on, no matter how exhausted, frostbitten, and ill the majority of them were. And on November 9th, he somehow got them moving again. Towards sunset on the following day, instead of a train of rescue wagons, a single man on horseback rode into view. This was Ephraim Hanks. Where were the rest of the wagon trains that were supposed to be showing up? Some of the rescue teams were turned back. The hardier ones fought through to Fort Bridger. Two rescue leaders pushed a single day farther east, but decided against crossing South Pass to look for the refugees on the Sweetwater. And returning to the fort, they persuaded all the other rescuers to give up the search. 77 wagons started west again along the trail back to Salt Lake City.
Meeting these returning wagons on the trail on November 12th, Kimball and Stout turned them around once again and they would then save the lives of scores of saints. The chief credit for the rescue, however, must go to the vanguard party led by Grant and Burton and reinforced by Ephraim Hanks. At last, the Martin Saints were able to abandon their handcarts as the weakest of them now rode in wagons supplied not only by Grant but by the Hunt and Hodgett companies. From the 9th of that month on, however, virtually every day at least two or three more people died. On November 16th, the refugees prepared to cross Rocky Ridge. At South Pass, the refugees were met by more rescue teams and again by even more at Fort Bridger. At last, every saint could ride, and the daily pace increased until the whole party was averaging over 20 miles a day, yet some had grown so weak that even this abundance of aid came too late. At Fort Bridger, John and Zilpa Jacques lost their two-year-old daughter, Flora. The couple carried their dead baby through to Salt Lake so she could be buried there. In Echo Canyon, less than 45 miles from Salt Lake, on November 27th, Sarah Squires gave birth to a baby girl. The parents named their infant Echo Squires. She would live to the ripe old age of 86, dying in 1943. The last stretch of the Mormon trail was the ruggedest of all as the saints had to climb and descend narrow canyons in the Wasatch Range, coming over high passes called Big Mountain and Little Mountain. Finally, on November 30th, the Martin Company entered Salt Lake City. At least three of the Martin Saints made it all the way from Liverpool to Zion, only to die the day after their arrival. The Hunt and Hodgett's wagons trickled in through the first two weeks of December, and they were the last of all the saints to arrive on December 15th. What is the death toll for the Martin Company? The church website puts it at 135 to 150. With the lowest at 135, that would be a 23.4% death rate. Again, that's probably a low number, just like with the other groups. And he writes, if we take the range of the death toll in the Willie Company as between 66 and 77, and the range in the Martin Company as between 135 and 170, then the total mortality count in these two handcart companies is between 200 and 240. In contrast, the toll in the much more famous Donner Party was 42, from one-fifth to one-sixth the number of deaths incurred by handcarts. The Mormon catastrophe of 1856 remains far and away the most deadly in the history of Western migration. So when they got here to Salt Lake and they find out how many died in this company, do you think that maybe they would start telling the truth about what happened? But of course they didn't. At once the propaganda machine of church publications began to cover up the disaster. Only four days after the Martin Company's arrival, the Deseret News acknowledged, as was to be expected, they have suffered considerably from storms and inclement weather and several have had their feet and hands more or less frosted, but are now comfortably housed and cared for. But the Lord was watching over even this ill-fated caravan of saints, for we can plainly recognize the kind hand of overruling providence in opening a way of escape for so many. So he writes, in that peculiarly Mormon vein with its sense of collective persecution, the brief newspaper notice closed with a defiant vaunt, let the world oppose the gathering of Israel, let the wicked scoff, rage, and imagine vanity, so long as the saints give diligent heed to the counsels of those placed to direct, the gathering will progress as shall please the Most High. By the time the tidings of the last handcart company reached John Taylor's office in New York, the disaster had been further sanitized. In the Mormon, Taylor quoted a letter from Brigham Young written in early December, and in this he also says, few comparatively have suffered. The letter closed with a characteristic young flourish, business remains dull, money is scarce and becoming scarcer, which will prove a great blessing to the people if they wisely improve the lesson. In early December, the streets of Salt Lake were abuzz with gossip and people were starting to put the blame on Brigham Young because they know what happened and they are realizing what happened. Heber Kimball acknowledged as much as he spoke in the tabernacle on November 2nd, a week before the Willie party got there. Some find fault with and blame Brother Brigham and his council because of the sufferings they have heard that our brethren are enduring on the plain. A few of them have died. And then he goes on to say, let me tell you most emphatically that if all who were entrusted with the care and management of this year's immigration had done as they were counseled and dictated by the first presidency of this church, the sufferings and hardships now endured by the com companies on their way here would have been avoided. And yet, there is not a single word before November 1856 indicating that they warned anybody about setting out from Florence too late in the season. And yet, Brigham Young always insisted that that had been his counsel and that it was entirely the fault of his short-sighted lieutenants. In particular, he singled out Franklin Richards and Daniel Spencer. Young outlined the ideal handcart trek as starting from the Missouri River on June 1st, and then he turned his famous talent for scorn on returning missionaries who he would insist had botched the 1856 immigrations. Then he finishes that with, if any man or woman complains of me or my counselors in regard to the lateness of some of this season's immigration, let the curse of God be on them and blast their substance with mildew and destruction until their names are forgotten from the earth. So again, I turned to church sources to see what they said about this. And in one of the footnotes for an article on the website, it says the experiences of the Willie and Martin handcart companies were tragic, and yet they led to great blessings. Notable among those blessings were the reestablishment of organized 
eyes of relief societies on crossing near Devil's Gate. After every apparent avenue of escape seemed closed, three 18-year-old boys belonging to the relief party came to the rescue and to the astonishment of all who saw, carried nearly every member of that ill-fated handcart company across the snowbound stream. The strain was so terrible and the exposure so great that they died from the effects of it. This quotes exactly word for word the thing that I talked about. In Saints, it says the first presidency had warned immigrants repeatedly about the dangers of starting for the valley late in the season. Where? When? And this said, knowing this, some men urged Franklin to recommend wintering the company in Florence. On the advice of Captain Willie and other leaders who promised that God would protect them from harm, Franklin also had faith that God would open a way for the immigrants to arrive safely in the valley, but he wanted them to decide for themselves if they should stay or go. Gathering the companies, he warned them about the dangers of traveling so late. What? Franklin Richards warned them? Okay. Some infants and elderly saints would likely perish, he said. Other members of the company would suffer disease and exhaustion. If the immigrants wanted, they could spend the winter in Florence. Brigham Young's son Joseph urged them not to press forward that season. Franklin arose again and asked the immigrants to vote on the matter. If you knew that you should be swallowed up in storms, he asked, would you stop or turn back? And if you go to the footnote for that, it says, August 5th, 1856, Franklin Richards, quotation edited for readability. Original source says, when we had a meeting at Florence, we called upon the saints to express their faith to the people and requested to know of them, even if they knew that they should be swallowed up in storms, whether they would stop or turn back. And it also talks about those three boys. So you can see that they, they keep giving that same story. And the bottom line is that they're going to say this wasn't Brigham Young's fault. This was a storm. None of this would have happened without the storm. And it is very important you remember that these people were starving before they even got to the storm. The next video, I will talk about the aftermath, what comes next, what is happening now, and why it's important to know this.